Sunday. This program is proudly brought to you by your Ford dealer and Ansett Australia. Media boss Conrad Black claims Bob Hawke offered to sell his services. Outrage over a senior law officer's attitude to rape. And the shuttle returns with a new view of our world. From National Line News, this is Nightline with Jim Whaley. Good evening. The slanging match between Bob Hawke and Canadian media boss Conrad Black took a startling turn today. Mr. Black claimed the former PM sought $70,000 to act as the secret eyes and ears in Canberra for the Fairfax newspaper group. The Canadian publisher was facing questions at a Senate committee investigating his ownership of the Fairfax newspapers. Peter Harvey has this report. Conrad Black began the controversy over ownership of the Fairfax newspapers. Today he was determined to end it and kill off suggestions that he was allowed to lift his shareholding from 15 to 25 percent only after a deal with Prime Minister Keating. I don't know, Senator Alston, what more I can do to, to bury the putrid corpse of this myth short of uh, driving a silver stake through a copy of this committee's terms of reference. In two hours of detailed testimony to the print media inquiry, Mr. Black recounted in minute detail a series of meetings with both Paul Keating and opposition leader John Hewson. They have been uh, absolutely irreproachable. There has not been a hint of a relationship in the comments of either of them or anyone speaking for them uh, uh, relating content of our newspapers to permitted ownership level. Not a trace of it. But Mr. Black's strongest comments came when he dealt with former Prime Minister Bob Hawke's attack on him before the inquiry. Conrad Black does not tell the truth. He has the habit of distorting events through the prism of his own perceived self-interest. Mr. Black said much of the former Prime Minister's evidence had been absolutely scandalous and reprehensible. He also accused Mr. Hawke of making racist remarks about him not being Jewish. His words constituted a degradation of every office that he has held. And Mr. Black also revealed that Mr. Hawke recently contacted the Black Company with a request. If we would anonymously hire him and pay him 50,000 U.S. dollars to be, and I quote, our eyes and ears in Canberra to keep an eye on the successor. Mr. Hawke is overseas and couldn't be contacted for comment. Peter Harvey reporting for Nightline. Serb gunners continue to batter the Muslim town of Karajda despite a tough newsstand by U.S. President Bill Clinton. He's backing calls by U.N. Secretary General Boutros boutros Ghali for extended bombing raids on Serb positions. Meanwhile, a U.N. convoy has left Sarajevo for Karajda with urgent medical supplies and faint hopes of bringing the shelling to an end. After being held up for two days amid wrangling with the Serbs, the UN convoy finally left Sarajevo airport to head to the besieged town of Garajda. A hundred soldiers and a 40-strong medical unit made up the attachment, but British light tanks weren't allowed to go, the Serbs permitting only small arms on armoured personnel carriers. They have left, but there is no guarantee they will get through. The Serbs have got a stranglehold on Garajda, which they have pounded relentlessly for more than three weeks. In defiance of the United Nations, and in flagrant violation of its status as a so-called safe area. They are the complete aggressors and wrongdoers. President Clinton, under political and public pressure to get tough, has said the Serbs must pay a higher price. He's pushing NATO to threaten wider air attacks. We are proposing to our NATO allies that we extend the approach used around Sarajevo to other safe areas, where any violations would be grounds for NATO attacks. We can't end this war by having imbalanced approach to the sides of the conflict. Sanctions, threats and bombing do not help this process. This is civil war. NATO is expected to decide tomorrow whether it can feasibly threaten punitive airstrikes. To do so, it will have to overcome Russian objections 
and military misgivings. Locating and attacking Serb armour without incurring civilian casualties may be easier said than done. Women's groups are furious over comments by the Federal Director of Public Prosecutions who said it was worse to rape a nun than a prostitute. After a quiet word from the Attorney General, Michael Rosines is already backing away from his statement. Mr Rosines wasn't talking today. Most women's groups believe he already said enough to a legal conference last night. person who takes a nun off the street knowing she is a nun and appreciating that she has kept her virginity sacred for years and would that knowledge raping her commits a greater crime than the person who is with the prostitute and has agreed to do certain things for certain dollars. And when there's a dispute about whether it involved one or two, takes the extra one for nothing. The comments drew a swift response from the prostitutes collective. Well, you should resign, I believe. In 1991, a county court judge gave a lesser sentence to a man who raped a prostitute, saying the psychological effect on her would not have been severe. But the women's electoral lobby says rape is rape, no matter who the victim is. You know, we're going to start judging women by their characters, by their occupation, or are we going to treat women as women and say that none of them should be raped? Two that have killed the prostitutes have been murdered this year, and the collective says the DPP's comments will do nothing to stop the violence. He was talking about how crime is not as important as the victim is selected carefully. That's a very clear message to a rapist. I think these uh, comments are most regrettable. They are wrong. Mr Rosines claims he meant to demonstrate that harm intended by an offender should be taken into account in sentencing and said he was fervently of the view that workers in the sex industry are in no different position to anyone else when it comes to application of the law. A court decision in Perth could spell the end of explicit posters in the workplace. Two women have been awarded more than $90,000 compensation for 12 months abuse after they objected to the pornography. Gail McIntosh and Heather Horn were cleaners, Peggy's they called them, at the Goodwin A construction site at Jarvis Bay. In 1990, the only two women amongst 600 men, they complained about girly posters in staff quarters. The Equal Opportunity Tribunal...